Welcome, folks. This is Mark Steiner. Good to have you with us here on The Mark Steiner Show on The Real News Network. We're approaching May 17th, and May 17th is the 50th anniversary of the Catonsville Nine. The Catonsville Nine was a dramatic thing that happened here in Baltimore, in Catonsville, Maryland, where nine people went to a draft board, destroyed the draft records, which at that time was a huge thing because those are the only records that existed for men about to be drafted to be sent to Vietnam. It became a huge cause around the country when they were arrested, and there's huge celebrations taking place over the next two weekends to remember what happened on May 17th, 1968, with the Catonsville Nine. We have with us people who were involved there. Dave Eberhardt, who was part of the Baltimore Four that preceded the Catonsville Nine. He went to prison for that act when they dumped blood on the draft records here in Baltimore City. He's a noted poet. He spent time in prison for the acts he did in 1967. He spent two years in prison at Lewisburg Federal Penitentiary. And his latest book is his memoir, For All the Saints, a protest primer. Dave, welcome, good to have you back with us. Thanks, Mark. And joining us here as well is Joe Trapea. Joe is the curator of films and photography at the Maryland Historical Society, co-director of the award-winning film Hit and Stay, which is about the Catonsville Nine, and he's appeared with me numerous times, a great filmmaker and activist. Good to have you in the studio. Thank you, Mark. It's great to be here. And Leah Michaels, who is a Baltimore native and a social Catholic feminist activist here in our community around the country. She is co-filmmaker of the internationally acclaimed film Rock, Rage, and Self-Defense, an oral history of Seattle's Home Alive. She also helped co-direct the Baltimore chapter of Hollaback uh, with Brittany Oliver uh, here in Baltimore, and good to have you in the house with us as thank well. Thank you, thank you. So let's go back to that moment in 1968, Dave. I mean, you were at the heart of all of this. You weren't with the Catonsville Nine, which I want you to describe for us what that was. You were with, uh, with the Baltimore Four that did a similar thing, dumping blood on draft records. But talk, take us back to that moment. The Baltimore Four uh, action took place a week after a giant demonstration at the Pentagon where the yippies and hippies uh, held hands and encircled the building to levitate. October 67? 1967. October 67, right. I was and there too. Yeah, that was the that. 21st of October. Then the 27th, right. four of us, myself, Tom Lewis, Phil Berrigan, and Reverend James Mangle, uh, went into the Customs House on Gay Street where the draft boards had been collected for their own safety from various points around town, used various ruses to go back to the files, pulled them out, poured blood, which we had uh, put in Mr. Clean bottles, and then uh, sat down, waited for the authorities. We preceded the nine, Baltimore Four. So let me talk about the significance of this event. Uh, you made a film about it, Joe, and you lived through it growing up because of your parents and the world you were in, Leah. Yes. So let me start with you. Sure. I mean, uh, and I just, for our listeners, or for our viewers and listeners here, to, to kind of talk about the significance of the Catonsville Nine. Why was it, why did it ring so loud for America at that point, for you, and for your generation as well? Well, I think it's really important because in, in one way, you know, I'm also an artist, and so there are lots of kind of important things that were done that the Catonsville Nine had ideas about. One, you know, the Baltimore Four when they were using blood, a lot of it's also like symbolic and having to do with, you know, of course, like the blood that Vietnam War was causing, not just for Americans, but for um, people in Vietnam. And then you move forward and they start to figure out at that point that the draft boards didn't have copies. So if you destroyed any of the draft files, then you'd potentially be saving people from going to the Vietnam and also potentially saving people in Vietnam from being killed by any of those people who might have been drafted. And so then you start looking, you know, it, the Baltimore Four wasn't necessarily a specific Catholic action and then the Catonsville Nine was um, all people who were Catholic. Either they were kind of rebel priests or rebel nuns or lay people and looking at how Catholicism really should be based on and is connected to social justice. And then what does that mean, right? And so when they started figuring out that there were no copies for these records and maybe if they could take as many as possible and kind of destroy them in this really symbolic way with homemade napalm and setting them on fire and then circling that in prayer and staying to get arrested and then explain why they were doing it, like that was, would have been huge. And then, so that's what they did. So, Joe, and you made the film, 
Yes. Hit and stay. Hit and stay. A history of faith and resistance. Why don't you pick up? That so, time? so the uh, the idea for the Catonsville Nine actually came from the trial of the Baltimore Four, uh, and one of the members of the Nine heard in court that the Selective Service system didn't have backup mm -hmm. copies. So the idea was they poured blood at first, but maybe the second time we do it, we should burn them so there's nothing left afterward. Um, so, so they, ma they made homemade napalm. They got the recipe from a, a U.S. Army manual. I mean, basically it was uh, jellified gasoline. And so the thing is the U.S. government used to purchase it from the Dow Chemical Corporation and they dropped it on Vietnam to defoliate the jungle so that it was easier to determine where the enemy was hiding. But they didn't clear an area before they dropped it, so they ended up dropping it on you know, trees and people alike mm -hmm. indiscriminately. So they got together, the members of the Nine got together a week before the action and made homemade napalm in uh, Bill O'Connor's basement. And out of kind of them, by the way, for people, he was a professor in Baltimore who was a noted radical activist and a Catholic as well. Yes, right. uh, he was one of the support activists uh, uh, working with the Nine. Um, yeah, they made the napalm in his basement and they transported it to the Selective Service Office in Catonsville and got the files outside and, and dumped it on and, and did their thing. But what was it about this event that became such a significant moment? in our history. I mean, it became a play. It became your documentary. It became, it went to Broadway, if I'm right, Catonsville Nine, or what, anyway, it went around the country as a, as a play. So what, what, what was it about this event that was so significant? I mean, why do we even bother remember it 50 years later? Well, I think uh, th their idea wasn't just to destroy files. They wanted to grab attention. They wanted to, to shock America into realizing what was happening. So they, they did that as Catholics to sort of uh, shock their church into taking notice. But they also knew, and they were very media savvy, that it would shock the nation to see priests in handcuffs. So Phil and Dan deliberately wore their Roman collars for the action and were filmed and photographed being put into a police wagon in their full Roman garb. Uh, it, it was an action that grabbed attention at the time, and um, and they kept they, they kept it going. They uh, throughout their trial, they kept uh, you know trying to get media attention. And then after the trial, uh, rather than go to prison, some of them went underground um, to to keep the momentum going, to keep the message alive, and it uh, it resonated with people uh, within. Less than five years of the action, the U.S. government discontinued the draft. And I think it's one of the most uh, effective political actions in American history. I mean, if you look at the Boston Tea Party, which happened in 1773-ish, um, <laughs> it, uh, it took until uh, 17... Circa. Circa. <laughs> Circa, yeah. yeah. It took until 1783 uh, to, to make it, you know, before the revolution was won. So here was an action that within five years had massive results. Go ahead, oh, Leah, and I was also going to say to build off that and kind of going back to one of the other questions you asked about, you know, like why does it matter and all of these other things and how does it affect kind of like my generation of activism, activists now and Catholics now, it was also... Like they, it was so interesting because they were able, not only did they do this action, but they were able to stay for a while and have like say prayer, but then have everybody kind of say a piece about why they were doing it and all of these other connections that it had. And so it was, you know, the Vietnam War in general, but also the fact that, you know, people of color were being drafted and then they didn't have rights here, you know, and like what did that mean for Vietnam and what did that mean to be an American and then you also had um, people saying like we understand that not just Vietnam but lots of other countries and people in other countries are suffering in order to like bring goods to America and all of these other I mean it was this kind of whole like Vietnam as a symbol for all kinds of civil rights and social justice issues that were going on and that like America benefits from the pain of other people and so what does that mean like how can we the nine thinking how can we as Catholics and as Americans and as citizens do something about that so I, I in a moment here I, I want to mention each one of their names and talk about who they were so we understand who these people were and what they meant but I uh, Dave let me ask this question first and we can talk about this for a moment together the film is called Hit and Stay that, jo that you made Joe Tropea you made a very clear statement about when you dump the blood or, and when 
Leah, you were describing what happened in Catonsville with the Catonsville Nine. The people who did their action, they stayed waiting to be arrested, mm -hmm. as opposed to hit and run, right. do the action and get out. Right. right. So what's the philosophy? What is the political meaning of the idea that you stayed and waited for the police to come and be arrested? I mean, that's well, something that's almost an anathema to some people. It has to do with a uh, theory of nonviolence, um, taking responsibility for your action, being transparent, um, and making a theater out of the whole event uh, and going to trial and uh, with the nine you had uh, great writers in Phil and Dan Berg and Dan 52 books a great poet and his play the trial of the Catonsville nine so talk about media savvy um, but hit and stay hit and run you don't get to appear <laughs> with the press mm -hmm. I mean the press actually drove us to the action of the Baltimore Four, which they would never do today. We had WBAL at the Catonsville Nine. Which is a local TV yeah. station here in Baltimore City. But if you run, which many actions took place, inspired by ours, but uh, where people didn't want to get caught, uh, you, you miss the theater part of it. Yeah, definitely. I think there's a lot of being able to control the narrative when you hit and stay, like Dave was saying, and so then, like you know they called the press beforehand like there was a plan for for all of this and then when you're able to have that time to really control the, your own narrative of why you're doing it and you try to control it in the court right which they wouldn't let us do by and large but they if you found a somewhat liberal judge right they would let you talk and in the Camden 28 uh, the jury sided with the with the actors because right. an informant had uh, entrapped them. But uh, as the trials went on, more and more was allowed to be said. I mean, you find with the trials of the uh, actors in the plowshares actions now that they're not allowed to bring in justification defenses, a higher moral law. They, Depending on the judge, they keep it out. So this is it's important kind of to focus in for a moment because a couple of things you mentioned, one is plowshares, one is the other things that took place in the country, country because of the Catonsville Nine um, and what that, what that inspired other people around America, so we want to come to that. But I think that it's important here for a moment to kind of um, re reflect on, on what, pe what happened to people in, in, that, in that demonstration. I mean, you went to prison. You spent... 21 months. 21 months at Lewisburg Federal Prison. Mm -hmm. uh, Dan and Phil Berrigan did the, both went underground. F and Phil and they and were, were captured and went to prison. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mary right? was underground for nine years until Mary she. Mary Moylan, you're talking yes, about. Mary Moylan. She was one of the Catonsville Nine, and she was underground for nine years before I think it just started getting to her, and then she turned herself in. So this is significant. I mean, these are people who put their entire lives on the line. Right. To stop young men from being sent to Vietnam and stopping Vietnamese from being killed by, by right. destroying draft records. Yep. And, and to call action to all of all of the things, the racism and, and everything that was going on. And, and also to challenge, really, the Catholic institutional church, right? Because as you pointed out before we went on the air, Leah, there's a right and a left here when it comes to the Catholic church, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> it's so funny when people, when this kind of comes up and people are like, oh, so are you Catholic? I'm like, how much time do you have? You know, like, it's, it's so complicated because people think they, when they hear Catholic, they automatically assume, like, incredibly conservative, right? Because I mean, a lot of the things that the Catholic church as an institution has done. But I'm like, no, no, you don't understand, like, the hippie liberal social, social like, radical Catholicism. Like, that's the... That's the kind of side. <laughs> and liberation <laughs> theology yeah. all throughout America. And right, definitely. And, and really, and they talk about, too, when you look at, like, Jesus as a person who was this socialist, you know, like, storytelling, mystic Jew, you know, like, who invited everybody to dinner, like, everyone, you know, the tax collectors and the poor and everybody. And I think that's, that's the kind of, like, social gospel mission that the Catonsville Nine were kind of focused on. I, I want to mention these names. And let's, I'm going to mention them, and you please describe who we're talking about here, these human beings who stood up and became the Catonsville Nine. Your comrades in arms, I mean, you, you, were, you were with them night and day. That was part of your world, Dave Everhart. So, I mean, um, and I'm glad you're still with us to be able to tell the story. But, um, and this, I'm reading these out of our, actually Dave Everhart's memoir. Um, but George Mishy, who's still with us. Mm -hmm. and George Mishy is who? George Mishy uh, was a labor organizer and army veteran uh, from, from Minnesota who is still with us today living in Minnesota. 
Uh, he was the member of the nine that attended Dave's trial for the Baltimore Four and got the idea to burn the files instead of pouring blood. And then we have also in the Canesville Nine, uh, Father Phil Berrigan and Father Dan Berrigan. Let's take them one at a time. Well, Phil. I like to put them together. I mean, okay. imagine it's these fine. handsome, charismatic priests. They both were, too. Uh, yeah. right, right, so right. media savvy, great writers. Uh, Dan, 52 books, as I said before. Phil had been uh, in World War II. He saw uh, he was the a combat. He was an artillery veteran. Right. Yeah. Yeah. right. And then um, uh, Dan, as a Jesuit, um, at any rate, the writing powers uh, and the uh, radicalism is just uh, charismatic. Right. And Dan had been to Vietnam, right. so he had seen, right. you know, children dying and, and right. just the devastation of that. He'd had bombs dropped on him. I think he was Amos. arrested 250 times, spent the most prison in Danbury uh, for the Catonsville Nine. So let me go through these. Tom Lewis. Tom Lewis uh, was a, uh, not a Baltimore native, but moved here um, from high school where he was a high school football star, and he had been recruited for the Colts by Johnny Unitas, but instead of that, he, uh, he worried about his art career and went to Europe and studied art. Mm -hmm. And came back and was radicalized during the Civil Rights Movement. He was sketching in uh, Gwen, Gwen Oaks Park uh, while some demonstrations were going on, and he became radicalized. To integrate, to, to desegregate Gwen Oak Park. Right, right. right. And uh, he <sighs> became radicalized and became a part of the Baltimore Four, and then put himself in legal jeopardy by Being acting again. again. So yeah, so Tom and, and Phil had already, with you, had all already been arrested when they decided, let's do it again. <laughs> yeah. so let's go well, we have our time, let's go through these. I just want people to know these names, as right. we say in these days, say their name as we right, say in today's course. world, right? Yeah. Yeah. David Darst. David Darst was a Christian brother from the Midwest. Uh, he was uh, among the youngest members of the Nine in his 20s, and he traveled uh, from the Midwest to take part in the action. I guess the network went that far that he heard about uh, some plans in, in happening in the Baltimore area. And a person who I got to know really well before she left and went underground, who I really always admired my entire life, is Mary Moylan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mary Moylan was a, uh, was a nurse. She trained at uh, Mercy. And she went on mission to Uganda, where she worked as a nurse, and was sent home for being too uh, radical, and uh, which turned out to be a bad move from her institutional <laughs> perspective because <laughs> she ended up staying with George Mishy uh, at his house in D.C. and became part of the plan for the Catonsville Nine. And John Hogan? Mm -hmm. John had been in uh, Latin America, I believe. Um, yeah, John was a mission missionary in Guatemala and uh, was sent out of Guatemala for being too radical, uh, getting too close with what they considered communist guerrillas, which, which meant farmers, basically, right. uh, that he was sent there to work with. And yeah, he was sent home and, like Mary Moylan, ended up in uh, the D.C. house with Michi and became part of the plan. And, and finally, Marjorie and Tom Melville. Tom, had, I guess, my show... Well, the Melvilles too. really uh, bothered their... Uh, orders by, I guess Marjorie was the more, Margarita we say, was the more radical and actually went into the hills with the gorillas. <laughs> I don't know about uh, Tom, but um, again, a good writer, several books. They were, um, uh, they were Mary Knoll missionaries that were sent to Guatemala and sent home at the same time as Hogan. So they were kicked out at, uh, by the authorities in Guatemala, I guess. And you were going to add what, Leah, to that? Oh, and just, you know, they wound up married, and I, it was interesting, too, that Margarita says in one of the films, in Lynn Sachs' film, actually, Investigation of a Flame, when they were, you know, communism was such a huge, obviously, issue at the time, and, you know, she says, oh, I understand, like, when you're fighting for the poor or when you're fighting for the underdog, then you're a communist, you know. And so let's talk about what goes on these next two weekends uh, as we celebrate this 50th anniversary of the Capesville Nine. It all starts uh, this Friday, May 4th. Um, at UMBC, there's a symposium. It's basically an all-day symposium. It runs from 3 to 10 p.m. And uh, we have 
Kathy Kelly and uh, Frida Berrigan is coming, who is um, the daughter of is the the oldest of um, Phil Berrigan and Liz McAllister, and um, and Marjorie, like we said, Marjorie Melville. She's she'll be joining us. Who is one of the surviving members of the Catonsville Nine, and um, there are lots of other wonderful uh, events that are going to be happening um, on Friday. And then Saturday is uh, some commemorative events, including uh, the keynote by Amy Goodman. Um, and that's going to be held at the Presbyterian Church in Catonsville. Uh, so there's a whole weekend worth oh, of yeah. events. Oh, yeah. There's, a whole we there's actually a whole month. I a feel like we events. have all and kinds so, of so, things going so on. So all, all of our viewers around the country, <clears throat> there's time to come to Baltimore yes. to take part in these events. <laughs> yes. Uh, and you can go to catonsville9.org. Right. Uh, to find out all this information and become part of this history, to celebrate this history, uh, and to celebrate the people who still survive and are still carrying it on. Um, you mentioned Liz McAllister. Let me just say Liz McAllister is now doing time in prison uh, because plowshares that came out of the Catonsville Nine is a movement where they attack war nuclear warheads uh, at different sites. She just did that. Liz is 78 years old now uh, and uh, is doing time in prison. And her daughter Frida, who will be here, actually has written a beautiful piece about uh, talking to her child about why their grandmother can't mm. be there and is doing time in prison mm -hmm. uh, for fighting for humanity. So also, a roadside sign is going to be erected and on dedicated Saturday. on Saturday, which is yeah. important. The yes, Maryland for historical Department marker. Of, uh, highways and. Uh, and other things. And yes. So, <laughs> how about that endorsement? On Saturday, there will be uh, members of subsequent actions like the Milwaukee 14 and the Camden 28 uh, that'll be taking part in events. Um, yes. And that's one thing we didn't get to talk about was the actions that came after Catonsville. Right. Uh, I charted about 30 in, in my research. Right, and Brendan and Willow will also be there who run Viva House, which is another really important um, community base for Catholic social Catholic workers justice. base here in Baltimore. Yes. And I think that is a really important piece of this, which is the all the kind of similar actions took place all over the United States because of the Catonsville Nine. Right. Uh, and it inspired thousands and thousands of people to resist the draft in the United States, to resist the war in Vietnam, uh, and it became a seminal event. Uh, that I think has to be remembered, and, I'm, and it means a lot to have all three of you with us here at the Real News Network. Leah Michaels, good to have you here. Dave Eberhardt, Joe Chapea, always good to have you around with us. Thank, thank you for you so much. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. And stay involved, stay committed. Come check this out in Baltimore. You don't want to miss these events. I'm Mark Steiner for The Mark Steiner Show, right here on The Real News Network.